Hello, welcome. I'm Chris. Welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show. This is the show where we usually talk about podcast audio production in great depth. Uh, but today's a little different episode. It's just going to be me recounting my experience open, opening and operating a brick and mortar podcast studio for three years. And there you see it behind me on the video. And by the way, if you're listening to the audio version of this, uh, all the there's only three images I'm going to show, and they're all in the blog post for this episode. So you can see it on the website. And we're not going to talk too much about the the images, but I thought this would be handy because you know a lot of people actually believe that like oh I can open up a local podcast studio and bring people in and record them and I can make money and all that and you can. So that's why I I wanted to give you my experience. Uh, I had the studio for three years. Um, so let's get to it. I discovered podcasting in late 2011. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't hear about it before then, but I heard about it and I somehow found Cliff Ravenscraft, which many of you, uh, well, from back in that era, a lot of people who got started in podcasting heard about it from Cliff or, um, when they went online to learn about podcasting, they found Cliff's show, which was really helpful back then. He doesn't do it anymore. So, and so what happened was I heard about podcasting and because of my background as an audio engineer, I immediately thought, well, this is, I can do this. This is easy for me, right? This is easy compared to making records and recording music and all that. So I immediately had like hundred percent confidence, right? So that's, so I started my own show uh, just for the heck of it, really. Uh, I started it in my own apartment solely for the experience of starting a podcast. And that's called The Chris Curran Show. And I am, uh, am I going to link to that in the show notes? I am. I'm going to link to that. So if you want to hear, it's like a little 20 minute monologue in my apartment. My The first podcast recording I ever did. Uh, the, it's linked to in the show notes. So check it out if you want to hear that. It's pretty funny. I mean, it's not funny, but it's not even that bad. It's not great, but you know, whatever. So very soon after that, that was the beginning of 2012, basically. And then very soon after that, I said, I'm going to open my own studio. So I was like, I'm going to look for a, a, a space, a retail space somewhere or a an office, you know, an office in an office building, and I'm going to open up a podcast studio. I'll get a bunch of mics and I'll be able to bring people in and sit them down and record and all that, right? So uh, the question is, why did I decide to open up the studio? And the answer is to earn money producing podcasts for local people, right? That that was the purpose for me opening the studio. Um, of course, I could do some of my own shows, but, you know, and I did. I'll tell you about that in a second. But mostly it was to earn money. I wanted to make a living. I was like, man, if I can make a living recording people on podcasts, you know, and, and being their engineer, that'd be great. So, all right. So on the video right now, I'm going to show you a couple of the other pictures. I'm going to chop my own head off on the screen. There's another picture. Um, well, for, first of all, the picture you see on the screen now, and again, they're in the blog post if this is the audio only, if you're listening to the audio only version. You can see it's just a big round table with four boom arms and four mics and then four headphones. And then on, there's a couch nearby, whatever. Um, that was the studio. And here's another shot chopping my head off on the on the video. But this is uh, me hosting one of my shows and I'm interviewing two local business people. So that's it from the other side, from the other angle. It's pretty cool. And then you have this picture, which is actually uh, my original setup my original equipment setup. So you can see, you know, a couple laptops, the smaller mixing board, the iPad, you know, my mic, I was using an SM7B back then, and then a little outboard gear, my channel strip. Anyway, that's kind of a cool picture. So I just wanted to show you the pictures up front so you get an idea. As I'm talking about the studio, you can sort of have it in your mind's eye. So, all right, well, if you're gonna open a studio, and my first thing was like, okay, let's, let me think about economics, right? I had no idea if this type of business could be profitable. Um, and I, I ran a bunch of numbers. I did. I, I put pen to paper and I ran through a lot of scenarios and I thought, hey, I can make it work. 
And uh, but really, I was just so energized to do it, right? Because again, I'm an audio guy, and I was like, man. I can do this. Like I'm more qualified than almost anyone. So I was so energized. I just did it. Right. I just was like so focused on doing it. And I'll talk later about the monetary success or failure of my studio. I'll mention that later after we get through some more stuff. So the history is, uh, let's not forget. I opened the studio in June of 2012. This was before serial hit in the fall of 2014. If you were around back then in the fall of 2014, you know that when Serial became a huge hit in the mainstream media, that lifted up podcasting so much. Like it, it can't be underestimated how much the whole podcast industry got a boost from that one, the success of that one show, which of course was a great show. Um, before that, and even during that, like the podcast space was pretty small and unknown. You know, it really was. Um, and when I started my studio, I didn't know anyone back then who, who, who ran a studio like this. Like I didn't, I didn't find other people having podcast studios. And so I had, you know, but still I was like, I'm just going to do it. Um, I'm sure some people must have had studios. I just didn't know about it. Right. Okay. So, all right. Well, what were my competitive advantages? Right. Well, first of all, my audio experience, again, I worked in the music business, so I can handle audio production and also my local networking experience. So for about four years before this, so since about 2007, 2008, I was actually working for my family business, uh, selling, I was a salesman in, a, in our roofing and siding company. And so I was doing a lot of networking in the big chamber of commerce in this area. So when I left the family business to start my own business, really. Actually, no, I worked for the family business in the mid 2000s. And then I did my personal development seminars and I wrote my book. I wrote a personal development book. I did that for like three years from like 2009 to 2011. And then in 2012 is when I started the podcast studio. So by then I had been networking locally quite a bit, meaning going to chamber of commerce meetings and all this, like I knew a bunch of people, right? That helped right? When I opened my studio, I already knew a bunch of people. And so what I did, I'm going to explain my strategy, but what I did, be, I just started inviting all the people I knew to come in so I could interview them. And the whole idea was that they're going to come and sit in my studio and they're going to see my studio and then they're going to know what I do. And then they're probably going to tell someone. And then maybe some of those people will want to host their own show, right? That was the idea. So I was fortunate that I found a space very close to my apartment. And I think that's important. If I had to commute like an hour to my studio, that would have been a drag. But literally, my commute was like five minutes. And, uh, you know, again, being a previous member of the chamber really helped a lot to get things started. So I signed a three-year lease um, that, you know, in commercial space, it's hard to get anything below, you know, anything shorter than a three-year lease or maybe even a five-year lease. So I signed for three years because I was like, hey, I'm going to do it. And it wasn't overly expensive. That was the one reason I decided on this space because it wasn't that expensive. It wasn't the best space in the world, but it wasn't too expensive. So like, even if I didn't hit my goals, I could probably still pay the rent. And, and that was important to me, right? Because I, I don't want to go into debt, right? owning a studio. Like that doesn't make any sense. So I got a place that was pretty inexpensive. It was in an older building and the space was a little unique. Like, um, I don't know, it, it might've been hard for them to rent to other people. So I think that's maybe why they gave it to me a little cheaper, which worked out for me. So there you go. My studio, which I called Fractal Recording, was born in June of 2012. And the equipment setup was... Um, let me switch up, put that picture up on the screen, but so I had four microphones. Well, I was using an SM7B, but the other three, but I really did buy four, but the other three are Sennheiser E835s. I had four Heil boom arms. I had four channels of DBX 166 SS, XS, sorry. And, uh, you could see that that's the the gear between my iPad and the, the Mac computer on the right. It's a 
couple rack spaces of gear. And the reason I had those compressors was because I was only recording on, you know, I was recording everything down to two tracks, right? Left and right. I was recording to stereo. I was not recording multi-track at that time. So the reason I had compressors and I ran the compressors to tape because, you know, people drift off mic and some people get really loud. And so these, the DBX 166 is really helped control the dynamics of the participants. Of course, I had a headphone amp. I did have a digital hybrid to take actual phone calls. Uh, that's right under my iPad in that picture. And of course, I had my iPad to play sound clips like Barry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, baby. I'll get to Barry in a minute. I bought my first Mac for that studio, which you can see in the picture on the far bottom right. I had a Focusrite interface. It was a stereo, you know, it was a stereo interface. I still have it. I don't know the model number. You could see it in the picture right to the left of my mixer, up and to the left of the mixer. It's there. But um, And I bought some couches and chairs for the studio. You know, like you could see, I bought some couches, some chairs, and, and I actually paid someone to sort of decorate around the studio. Just, I mean, because there was nothing there, right? I needed something. It had to look like a studio. So she had some radio style decorations, like from the radio era, and uh, several like uh, tables built on top of old speaker cabinets. You can see one right on the screen right there. And you can see it in the pictures on the website if you can't see it here. But that's an actual speaker with a little tabletop on it. So I had two of those end tables. And I had one bigger coffee table with a big, huge speaker on the bottom. It was pretty cool. Uh, so All right. So now I had my studio. And I was like, all right, well, here's... And this was, of course, I planned this in advance to start a bunch of shows myself. So that on my website, so on the Fractal Recording website, it would list like, hey, we have this show, this show. Like you could at least see three or four shows that the studio was producing. I didn't want to have the website have zero shows, right? That doesn't that doesn't look good. So I started a few shows on my own. Uh, one of them was the local business networking show, which I call, was called Business Beat Radio. And that was the show where I just invited all the local people from the Chamber of Commerce to be on my show. So like every day I'd interview one or two guests or whatever I could, maybe one, I think I averaged one day. Um, but that was pretty cool because to get to know people. And from that, by the way, from bringing those people in, I did have eventually four or five clients sign up to host their own show. And then they would come into the studio, they'd bring their guest with them. And then the host and the guest would sit down right at that table and I would sit there and engineer the session and they would sit there and talk. It was, it was great. I also started another show called Social Media Unscrambled, which was a big hit. That's where we first started using the Barry clips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right, Barry. Uh, I started another show called The Geezer and the Geek with Doc South. I started my Mystic show, which I still have. That's a show that I started in 2014 or 2013. I don't know. And it's... Uh, it's all about spirituality. I still do episodes of that from time to time. So if you're into like meditation or spirituality, check out The Mystic Show. Uh, I did one called Career Buzz Radio, which I had a co-host for. And I did one called Senior Care Radio, which I had a co-host for. So that was another... So some of the shows I hosted myself, but other shows, what I would do is I would say, like the Senior Care Radio show... There was a woman who, she was in the senior care industry. She had a private company that helped seniors uh, find good care and help families place their, you know, mothers and fathers who were elderly into homes that were good. She ran a business doing that. And so I met her and I said, look, let's host a show. You can be the expert on the subject and I'll be the sort of like the host guy, right? Just someone else who's there to open the show and whatever. And then prop her up as the expert. So I did several shows like that, like the career show, the senior care show. I also started my own internet radio station, partially because I just wanted to do it. And I found a way to do it. And it only cost me, I forget how much I was paying. It was like 40 bucks a month, maybe, maybe 50 bucks a month to maintain an online radio station. And I could, I put in all my music tracks 
and it was they were all being played on internet radio and all the royalties were being taken care of by this company that I found to do to take care of all that. And then we would also stream live on my internet radio station. You know, audio only, obviously. It's on the radio. It was on the radio, uh, on the internet radio, of course. So that was fun. I just did it just to do it. And I had that running for, I don't know, maybe like a year, maybe a little less. And then I just turned it off because, you know, streaming live, even with video, anytime you stream live, in the beginning, it's hard to get people to tune in, right? And especially for like internet radio station. So, but again, I did it just because I wanted to do it, right? So they have the experience. So like I said, I was attending a lot of the Chamber of Commerce events. And uh, most people, you know, I would invite them to come on my business show, right? And so they could see my studio. And here's the thing. Back then, again, 2012, 2013, most people didn't even know what a podcast was. Like literally. Like probably 90% of people, they literally didn't know what it was. They might have heard the word. Some people have heard the word podcast, but they didn't know what it was. So back then you had to actually tell people about it. And uh, I think that's one reason why in the end I got a bunch of clients, but I didn't grow my studio to where I wanted it. I, and I think it was partially because I was just too ahead of the curve. Like I was, I was doing podcasting when podcasting hadn't uh, blown up yet. Right. So it was just timing. I was a little too early. I think now you don't have that problem. Right. All right. So of course at the studio, I met Barry. Yeah. Oh Yeah. Barry was the maintenance guy for the the buildings in our in the complex. There was like four or five office buildings. Barry was the maintenance guy. Uh, great guy. He was an older gentleman, you know, sort of, I would say, pretty close to retirement age. Like, I think he was just, you know, kind of like a handyman maintenance guy. Um, and he would stop by my studio a lot of times. And if I wasn't busy recording, um, he would come in and sit down and just chat with me. And he would sort of also like hide and kind of take a break, right? So he would come in and sit behind the wall. So, you know, because he, again, he's an older guy, he's a maintenance guy. At times he just wanted to sit down and relax for 10 minutes. So it was cool. So him and I would talk and that's where I eventually, because his voice is unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on, man. So like after a while, I started breaking out a microphone and I slowly moved it toward him and he didn't care. I told him I was recording him every time. He's like, oh, I don't care. He's like, he didn't, he didn't really know what I was doing, but he's just a nice guy. And he, you know, so we have so many sound clips <laughs> of Barry. Usually I pretend that he's here in the room with me and I ask him questions. So it's like, Barry, uh, what do you think about this, this episode so far of me, uh, giving all the backstory to the, to the studio? There's no activity, no giggle, no nothing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I have, like, so many sound clips. Oh, forget it. So many classics. I mean... Nah, it ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Barry, what do you think of this section of the show? It's a mess. Yeah, exactly. It's a mess. All right, so anyway, um, Barry was great. And actually, I went to New Jersey about a month ago. Uh, at the end of 2021 to visit family. And I drove by the building and I think that the smaller building I was in, it, I didn't see any cars there and we drove by twice. So I don't know uh, if he's still there. And he was, uh, he actually like joined the Navy and was a seaman for many, many years. So he used to talk and he joined when he was in the sixties, when he was a young guy and he would, he you know, served on ships and sailed around the world. And he had so many stories. He, he was literally the best storyteller I've ever met in my life, hands down, not even a question. And I also have a couple clips of Barry that are about a half an hour long where he kind of goes and tells stories. And I still haven't released them. I don't, I mean, at some point I will, but I, ha I have to release it the right way, right? Because Barry is just so legendary. All right, anyway, back to the studio. So Fractal Recording, as you can see, it was just me running everything. The business, the equipment, the studio, everything. I was engineering. I was doing all the post-production. Literally every single thing I was doing personally. And I had the wonderful idea to um, bring on a partner of sorts. 
uh, first, the first person I met sort of wanted to be a partner and, uh, she was more into like the mark. She was a marketer and a salesperson really. And that's, that's exactly what I thought I needed because I, my plan was I would stay in the studio and do all the technical work and produce all the audio and someone else can be out and about selling so we could get more clients. Right. So anyway, that was the plan. And so the first person I sort of tried to partner with, she, uh, we hadn't even agreed on anything yet, like literally. And she already threatened to sue me (laughs) and it just, it literally freaked me out. It literally freaked me out. And, you know, thank God the person was all bark and no bite. Uh, I didn't get sued. She didn't own anything. It was completely ridiculous. I don't know. It was, it was crazy, but You know, unfortunately, anyone can sue anyone at any time. I was like, I don't know. Maybe she has a brother who's a lawyer, and they're just going to start throwing lawsuits my way every two weeks and make me jump through 97 hoops and spend a ton of money. Uh, People go bankrupt that way, right? If Yeah, anyway. uh, So I did actually change the name of my studio after she was gone. Uh, At first, it was called Internet Media Broadcasting. IMB, Internet Media Broadcasting. Ooh, sounds so big and official. I'm glad I didn't go with that. Anyway, then I changed it to Fractal Recording, which is one of the best names ever created, I think. (laughs) No, because I love fractals and obviously, yeah. Uh, And the second person I sort of almost partnered with, but it wasn't really partner. I sort of hired him as a salesperson. And he, so he came on as an employee and I paid him for three months munch. (laughs) I paid him for three months during which we designed and printed these elaborate media kits with lots of information and pictures. Because he told me, he's like, oh, when I go in to see a client, I need to give them a folder with all a bunch of information and illustrations and yada, yada. And he's like, you know, no one's going to even think about starting a podcast show unless they have all the info and it looks professional. So I literally, we printed a thousand of these media kits. It cost me, I don't even know, at least three or four thousand dollars, maybe five thousand dollars, and at basically the first three months he didn't sell anything because he was we were sort of getting the media kit together and yeah different stuff, and then after three months and I was paying him every month too quite a bit, uh, he just left. So I had all these media kits and I had all I paid all this money to him, and he was gone and that really oof that hurt, but. Whatever, it's only money, and that's the day when I decided I'm, I'm never going to partner with anyone ever again. Now, I don't really mean that, but I kind of do mean that. I really, I'm, I'm not going to do it. It would have to be an amazing opportunity and an amazing person and yada, yada, yada for me to, to consider partnering with someone like that ever again. So, all right, well, the studio, let me tell you a few th- negative things about the studio. Because like I said before, I wasn't paying that much money and it wasn't the, you know, the most luxurious office building, right? Outside those windows, you could see them on the screen, right? You see these windows? Um, Right outside was a big dumpster. And those windows were single pane windows, which means they're really thin. They're almost like paper. And so when the the truck, the, the dumpster truck would come to the garbage truck would come and empty the dumpster. It was so loud. Like if you were doing a show, like you just, you literally had to stop. It was so loud right outside the window. So, and it was so bad. One time I was, this woman came in to record a voiceover. She's like, oh, can your studio do voiceovers? I was like, yeah. So I had my my CV12 microphone, right? It's a pretty good, you know, like a condenser mic, really good large diaphragm. Anyway, I set that up for her and she's recording and all of a sudden the truck came outside and she's like, oh, let me go. uh, I need some water. She she was kind of nice. She didn't even, it was embarrassing for me because like I'm supposed to be recording her with quiet. And anyway, she kind of just let it go and the truck left and then we started again. But it was so embarrassing for me. Really embarrassing. But also the office next door, which was like through that wall over there. One time they just got this new machine and it's just started running and it was like, 
And it was like kind of loud and it was coming through. It was getting into my recordings. And I went over and I'm like, hey, can, what is that? Can you turn, turn it off? They're like, well, we can't turn it. It's got to run all day today, but maybe tomorrow or something. And I was like, oh, my God. So anyway, those are some of the downsides of having a studio that wasn't really a studio, right? So here's the thing. I'll, this is how it all ended. So anyway, I had the studio for three years. It was great. Met a lot of people. I absolutely loved it. Loved the whole experience. I learned so much from it. I had so much fun. I made good friends. Uh, I also paid my dues, right, for what was to come next, which I'll briefly describe in a second. Um, and the painful experiences, I don't, I mean, I still remember them, but they're not painful anymore. I mean, I don't, whatever. It's the past. I learned from it. It's over. You know, the people who screwed me over, I don't hate them. Whatever. Go ahead. Live your life. So I decided after three years not to renew my lease. And that also happened to coincide with moving to Colorado. And it just sort of happened that way. I didn't really plan it that way, but, you know, it just happened that way. And when I moved to Colorado, that's when I would start engineering all my sessions remotely over the internet, right? So since then, since 2015, I have not, I don't have a physical studio anymore and I don't have people come here or anything like that. So was the studio profitable? That's the question. Uh, the answer is barely. It's an honest answer. It took a lot of effort and technically the studio was profitable, but it wasn't that profitable. Um, if I had a good salesperson who could have been out there selling people on starting their own podcast to help market their business, you know, like if we had, instead of having five or six clients, if we had like 30 clients, we would have been doing just fine. But the universe is funny. This is, this is funny. As soon as we moved to Colorado, I got a call from a New Jersey business a New Jersey business that was very close to my studio and they wanted to start their own podcast. But right at, off the bat, they told me, look, we know you have a studio, but we don't want to come into your studio. We want to do it from home. Is that, can we do that? Is that okay? <laughs> and I was like, that's amazing because actually I don't have my studio anymore and I'm, I'm doing everything remote. So it was like a perfect fit. I got immediately got the new client, like literally within two days of moving into this house. So it was like the universe, you know, speaking to me. And then of course, within about five months from then, I, that's when I got my, the big contract with Forbes to produce their entire podcast network, which that lasted about six or eight months in 2016. And that's, that was really great. That's, that's the client client that sort of pushed me into raising my rates more and, and, and getting bigger, bigger companies as clients right? That want to pay a higher rate. So yeah. So what did I learn? Well, I learned that when you know you can be successful at something, you just need to have, you just have to be bold and keep working at it and keep adapting. So, you know, it, it I mean, this happens to everyone who's successful. They, uh, I just realized, is my camera pointing too far down? Anyway, um, anyone who's ever successful, you know what they do? They put their head down, they focus, and they work really hard for years. Years, not a month, not one year, three, four, five years. And those people, those people are successful. You can't stop someone like that. So eventually you will arrive in a place, you know, like if, and this, is, this is like almost like life advice, right? If you have a goal and a vision, you set out to achieve it. And eventually you will arrive in a place where you are making a good living, doing something you love. Although that place where you end up, it's definitely not going to be the place that you originally had in mind. <laughs> so this is the thing about life, right? We can, we can push forward to achieve a goal we want to achieve, but the universe, everything, every, you know, you, you don't know what's going to happen in five minutes, let alone if you're going to achieve your three or five year goals. So the universe, it, life happens and you end up being successful as long as you're pursuing a worthy goal and a worthy ideal. So, uh, so, so that's what really, that's what I learned from, uh, well, I didn't learn it from ha ha opening this studio, but 
it was reinforced, right? That I can make a career out of this. And okay, I thought I was going to be in that physical studio forever. But of course I wasn't. But everything's fine. Everything's great. I mean, and these days I'm even doing less production work. I'm doing more teaching at podcast engineering school, which by the way, what a segue. Oh, the kid is just, the kid is hot. Anyway, uh, the next podcast engineering school starts on April 19th, 2022. So uh, anyway, if you want to produce podcasts from home and make a great living, or if, if you have a maybe one of your children who's in their early 20s or mid 20s, they don't know what they're doing with their life. Hey, learn how to produce podcasts from home. You can make a lot of money, a lot of money if you know what you're doing. Um, so also, here's another call to action. This is a weird one, but I'm going to say it. I actually have an idea <laughs> for uh, a very specific podcast production business, but I can't do it alone. And I know I just said I'll never partner with anybody, but I, collaborating is different. Uh, so if you're looking to making money in podcast production or something, and, and, you, and you already know what you're doing, like if you, if you can produce podcasts... Uh, well, and you have, you know, and whatever, and, and you, you're interested in maybe hearing my business idea and maybe whatever, uh, maybe collaborating or something. N nothing is in stone, obviously. Everything's all up, up in the air. But I just have a great idea, and I'm not going to do anything with it if it, I need someone to help do it. So if you're that person or if you know someone, reach out to me um, on the website, podcastengineeringschool.com. Just go to the contact page, send me a note. Um, but you have to be serious though. Again, and it would be like almost like a three-year type of commitment, right? Not really three years and not really a commitment, but that has to be the mindset when you start a business, right? Like we're going to do this, we're going to do it and do it right, whatever. Anyway, I don't know if that sounded silly, but whatever. All right, well, that's it. So thank you for listening to the Podcast Engineering Show and, I'm, and watching on YouTube. Um, if you thought this was interesting, you can share it if you want, but I appreciate you listening and watching and, uh, I will be back. I'm, I'm scheduling a few interviews now, so I will in, in the near future have more episodes where I'm interviewing someone. Um, I'm going to do some short interviews on YouTube with video with, with guests showing their screen. And I'm also going to do some more, uh, longer, normal, longer interviews, audio only for the podcast feed, because I do, I, I don't want to do everything on video because then the audio podcast is really weird. I don't know. Does that make, that doesn't make sense. All right. That's it. I'm done. I'll shut up now. Thank you. All right. We'll see you. Bye.